actually talked recently about tools, and hopefully you should see the, the home page of my uh, PowerPoint here. Um, but I figured because I am so deep into mobile right now and I have so much value to add there, I figured I'd almost give you two presentations here. So um, Greg described this as a project management class, and you guys are really learning the project management aspects of ISD. So I didn't want to totally go on a tangent on mobile 100% because I knew um, I could really add a lot of value to that actual focus as well. So I figured I'd do a duality here. So is everybody good? They can see my screen? Yes. 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 All right. Perfect. All right. Good. And um, I have the chat up too. And um, I'll certainly look at the chat. If you have questions, um, it doesn't look like I can make the chat window terribly big unless I can. Ooh, I can expand it. All right. So um, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them in chat, and then I'll try to just kind of roll through the questions. I read all the questions you guys sent ahead of time, and uh, I thought they were great. There were so many of them that um, I'll try to hit on as many as I can, but without just basically doing a QA, um, there'll be some I missed. But if there's a burning question that you have, then by all means, just ask it. All right, so I'm going to start out talking about project management, and then I'm going to go to mobile learning. And I want to do a couple things. I want to talk about all the tools that are used, but I'm going to actually take one case study, which on Monday we released a game for Discovery Kids. So what I'm going to do is, as I present tonight, I'm going to show you the different steps in the Addy process what tools a project manager might need, and I'll show you very various deliverables for one given project. And it happens to be a mobile e-learning project. So uh, that's good, Maureen. I'm glad. Just fire away if you have any questions on how to get into the industry. As Greg mentioned, um, I actually worked for a couple companies, exception, Exceptional Software. Rowan pulled me in. That was 2004 I've been teaching, I think. Well, I started there in 2000, yeah, 2004, 2005, I started teaching at UMBC, but when mobile came out, I started in my basement, and, and I've been able to do client work and make profits that way, but now I'm actually getting to de dedicate myself to games, which is really cool. Um, I get paid to make them. So hopefully you can see my um, computer screen, but um, Discovery Kids on Monday, we launched this Zach and Haley game, and it's like an Angry Birds type game, but... Um, but it actually is geared toward education and learning about different species in the ocean. So we take the Angry Birds concept and then we layer in education. So hopefully parents, instead of handing their kid Angry Birds to entertain them in the doctor's office, they actually can hand them Scuba Adventure. So, um, so I'm going to use this as a case study as I kind of go through. All right, so to get started, the questions we're going to answer, and I'm going to go for um, probably a pretty solid hour here. So um, if anybody has to step away, go for it. If you have any questions, ask them in line. Um, no problem at all. All right, so we're going to talk about what tools facilitate project management. I'm going to take you through the Eddy process and show you a peek behind the hoods of what MindGrub uses to make all these, these really cool applications and mobile learning games. What are the benefits of tablets? So I'm going to then move into mobile and really delve on the mobile market. And I'm going to look at how you can incorporate tab tablets. What are the statistics of mobile? And that it isn't a fad. It is, it is definitely a huge paradigm shift. Um, resources that are available. A lot of questions were around how do I make mobile? Um, or how do I make mobile learning content? And then what are the trends in mobile and where are things going? So that's where I'm going to end up with. All right, so first project management, since this is a class on project management, I'll give you a little bit of a peek behind the, the scenes of the tools we use. Um, and I really broke them down. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of tools. I'm just going to do a big brain dump, um, essentially. I don't know, Greg, if there's any way to record, um, go to webinar. But if there is a way to record, you know, you might want to record, because I'm just going to kind of do a brain dump here on a bunch of tools. Um, I can certainly post this deck. Um, online. I'll, I'll post it on my site and give a link to Greg. But essentially the different tools I'm going to talk about are first overall tools for project management. 
Then I'm going to go through the ADI cycle. I'm going to go through analysis and talk about the tools we use there, design, development, integration, and evaluation. You guys probably know the different parts of ADI. We actually use, um, in the software development world, we use a software development cycle. Um, we really call it analysis, um, information architecture and design. Or we do analysis, we do information architecture, we do design, graphic design is a separate step. Then we do development, and then instead of integration, that's part of development and integration is one step. And then we do implementation, if it does have to go to a store, et cetera. And then we do ongoing support, more so, no, so more so than evaluation. But it doesn't really matter. If you're producing a product, you basically go through these same steps. Whether it's called Addy or it's called the software development life cycle, it's really the same steps. And I'm going to talk about the tools that we use um, through these steps. All right, so first, overall tools. You know, you can't get away without having a central calendar. Microsoft Project, if you are a large organization and you do a waterfall methodology, Microsoft Project is a pretty um, handy tool. We generally either use Microsoft Project or Excel, but we create a roadmap and a project plan, and then we do resource planning and cost estimates. And MS Project, if you know how to do it, it's pretty good for that. Um, but it's got really a sweet spot. The dirt simple projects, it's overkill. But the really sophisticated projects, um, it's really hard to do micro level blocking. Also, there's been a big shift to agile project management. And so there's some better, well, there's some parallel tools that you might use for agile project management. Um, there really isn't a great tool. A lot of people use JIRA, and I'll talk about that. There isn't a great tool for agile project management. but Microsoft Project definitely is not a good tool for that. And then lastly, email. You can't get away without having email nowadays. It's almost as vital as water. All right, so those are the overall tools. Now the analysis stage. What we do for analysis is we largely make a big spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet might have multiple tabs in it, but what we're trying to get to are the requirements. So I'll, um, I'll pan here, and um, I'll pull up uh, Zap Toys. And I actually haven't looked in here, but I, I imagine I have some requirements docs. So here what we would do is um, we actually put requirements together as a quote. And um, this was for a Zap Blaster, so a totally different game. but. We'll actually put requirements together where we detail how much time we need to create wireframes. And I'll talk about those as the next step. And this is our software development cycle. So discover, define, information architectural, visual design, development. And then we don't necessarily put ongoing support. We do that as a second contract. But we do um, testing and project management. We put line items for that. So then we just basically list requirements. You know, it needs a loading screen, it needs a game center, a selection screen, a help screen, firing screen. And then based on the development, we generally do design information architecture as a percent of that. So it's essentially a requirements document is the initial um, analysis and design part. Now, there's some exception to that. Um, sometimes we actually have to do market analysis. And we might get paid for that, we might not. But for a lot of clients, because we are always trying to do something really innovative for them and disruptive in the marketplace, a lot of times we do a lot of market research and competitor analysis before we get started on a project, whether it's mobile learning or not. Um, particularly in learning, there's even more things you can do in the beginning. You can start to look at user demographics. Um, you can start to look at uh, you know, doing content inventory of existing content. There's a ton of stuff you can do to organize your project basically keeping within Excel and Word. The other thing, I have iTunes on here because on the mobile track, we happen to do a lot of market research to look what's already in the store. So we don't want to you know, have a client spend 100 k with us to build a mobile app, and we just did the exact same thing their competitor already has out there. Um, so we certainly do in the analysis days market research. All right, so then the next big step is the design step. And we, as a software development cycle, we break these up into two. 
but I'll just talk about them as one um, for design, which uh, keeping to the Eddie process here. So the biggest part of it is storyboards. Um, you got to have storyboards, and from a project manager perspective. There's really like two spectrums of project managers that I see. There's project managers that act like the quarterback, and there's project managers that act like the water boy. And you really want to be the quarterback. So you might have a project where you have a really complicated game you're making, and you have a game designer or an information architect, and they're going to make very, very detailed wireframes. Um, I know when I make software products, I'm doing some really cool stuff, and I'll show you some examples like augmented reality projects and stuff, I don't actually have to produce anything anymore. It's awesome. Um, I just get to basically send emails all day and then have meetings and tell everybody what I think the project should detail. And I have somebody that makes detailed wireframes, but in the education space, you're not, it's not that, um, you don't have that luxury to have a full-time information architecture, architect who's generally going to make those wireframes. So at minimum, you've got to be able to make some storyboards in PowerPoint. That's very important. Um, and let me show you an example of what those wireframes are or what those storyboards kind of detail. So if I go back to my one case study that I'm doing, um, the Zap Toys project, I'll just pick up one of the renditions of storyboards. You can see here's rendition 5, 4, 3. You know, we make lots of versions, and you can see these happen to get updated over three days. Um, and this was one of my game designers, Alex, who now leads uh, our gaming division. Um, but he makes the wireframes based off the initial requirements I put together. And so it's twofold. Um, in some classes, we teach about storyboards. In other classes, we call them wireframes. Sometimes you'll hear them referred to as templates. And I'll talk about the difference now. The difference is that this is a wireframe. It's showing individual snapshots of how the game should work. So I have the loading screen. Um, I have the character selection screen. You can pick between. Now it's Zach and Haley. Um, I'll actually, you saw it on the home page, but um, we also have a microsite for it. So so you know a little bit more about the game, I'll play, I'll play our microsite video, and hopefully you should be able to see my video. Um, so this is a microsite that we launched. Um, you can see here Minecraft and Zap. Um, that's our now our uh, our Hong Kong um, sales division. They're a toy manufacturer and a friend of mine, but um, we collaborated to put this game together. Um, so let me play this video for you. Hopefully you can see it okay. It'll be a little chunky probably. All right, so you can see it kind of morphed into this um, ZachAndHaley.com game. Um, but essentially, if you follow along there, what it does is um, it's these two kind of explorers, and you go through and explore underwater adventures or the underwater um, levels, and then you have this field guide, and you discover information about these sea creatures, and then you take a, a quiz about them. Um, so it is Zach and Haley. At the time, we had these choose the characters, which you could see we did a lot more character design, and I'm going to talk about that. But we wireframe the entire game out. Here's choosing your color, um, and then we have levels like Angry Birds. You select your different levels. So that's a wireframe. 
And it's very important that you wireframe all your screens. And again, in the education side, the, the project manager as the quarterback, you're going to actually wireframe out a lot of these screens. You might do it in PowerPoint, but you're going to really try to set the direction on things. Then there's also the storyboard. So this is a little more storyboard-esque. Notice it's in the same PDF, but it actually shows how the gameplay works. You can swim back and forth, up and down. You get oxygen for air. Um, you have to take pictures, um, and then you can pause the game, and then you complete the level. You know, so there's an actual storyboard that shows that flow. But needless to say, you want to detail all the ways the game's going to work. That's a wireframe. And whether it's e-learning, a game, doesn't matter. You want to detail it out. Games are a little more special in that there's a second step. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Let me jump back to the, uh, the PowerPoint here. So to do those storyboards or to lay stuff out, you want to use PowerPoint. And you guys, as the on-the-ball on PM, you might have to rough out a few of those things. Uh, quick and dirty works just fine. It doesn't have to be totally slick as long as you're going to go to a design phase. It saves time to rough things out on paper before you go to design, though, particularly for games, because you need to um, do a lot more than just draw a pretty picture, and I'll talk about that. And then there's a lot of other tools you can use for doing more robust wireframes and storyboarding beyond PowerPoint. Um, Lucid Charts is a pretty quick you know, and simple one to use. Then if you're a PC user, Visio is like, you know, it's been around for a while. It's, it's got a lot of functionality. It's like PowerPoint on steroids for creating these um, storyboards. If you're a Mac fan, then a lot of people really love OmniGraffle. That's really good for information architecture as well as you can do storyboarding. And then a lot of designers, particularly game designers, to do um, the storyboards in particular, they use InDesign. All right, so part of the design phase on an application, you do the wireframing, and then you do template designs. And on the game, you still have to do the template designs. So anything you do, whether it's e-learning or, um, or not, you have, to do, you have to design templates. So this is actually this is some older designs. Let me see if I can find um, some template designs for... Uh, the game. Here we go. All right. So these were um, these were some very early on template designs, but uh, they were. So you can see these were like sample loading screen, and it actually looks nothing like this. You can see now we branded it like we have this generic scuba diver, and then we ended up doing a backstory, and we branded it Zach and Haley. That's really important in e-learning. You really want that kind of backstory. Uh, but those were more template designs. But what we actually ended up doing or having to do in the design phase is actually do character designs. And so we actually designed each of the little pieces out and designed all the little characters that you see here. So that's really important. And that's visual design aspects. And then we went through and we designed all the different fish, et cetera, in the game. Uh, yeah, Maureen, just drop me a line. Definitely, uh, you know, we take on interns all the time, especially if you have the requirement for Greg. Um, you know, I take a lot of the, the internships from the ISD program, too. Um, so this, we build all the way up all these different levels so that you finally take the quizzes and unlock the last level. And then we had this, um, you know, the abysmal planes underwater, and you'd be a submersible that you could go through. That's the final level of the game. And if we have a ton of success, we'll probably release additional levels, et cetera. All right, so jumping back here, um, that really is the, um, the graphic design phase of this. Let me pull back my PowerPoint here. All right, so then we have... Um, Graphic design, Photoshop, fireworks, actually a lot of that stuff was done in Illustrator. Um, Greg, has my choice of tools changed over time? Interestingly enough, um, the same buckets of tools that you need 
generally stay the same. So we still need to do information architecture and wireframing. That process never really existed, and then when it did, the first tools that came out are still pretty much in the marketplace, but there's been a lot of new tools since. Um, for visual design, it's pretty much been the same tools the entire time, Photoshop, Fireworks, and Illustrator. Um, it's pretty much the same tools there, so that hasn't changed. There are some elements now where no tools existed before, and now there are additional tools we use, like, like Google, having Google Apps. We use Google for everything now. Uh, Google Spreadsheets, Google Docs, all, any company document is pretty much a Google Doc now. Now, that is a drastic tool change. So I would have used just Word before. Um, now I end up using Google Docs. And I should have in my first slide actually included Google Docs. Um, I just wrote email in there. But uh, yeah, so that has been a change. Um, all right, so then you have the design phase. Then you go to development. And um, normally development are like the actual development tools. So, like for mobile, one of your questions was, what are the development tools? To make Zack and Haley that game, we actually use Flash to make all the characters to make animated sprites. And then for programming it all together, we use uh, Corona. And those are developer tools. But what I did is I actually put project manager tools on here. So, the first project management tool that I think everybody should really just embrace is um, Basecamp. So Basecamp, which is on um, Basecamp.com, after you log in it says Launchpad.37 Signals, is a project management tool. It's really like a project bulletin board and, and communication hub. So it's not nearly as complicated as like Wave used to be, um, if you remember that short-lived product. Um, it's not like an online um, open community. It's really just project-based. You can see here, actually I have a number of clients that use it. Um, Curiosityville, KIPP, um, Wheelhouse, and they have separate base camps. And so when I log in, um, I essentially can go to any of the different base camps. It's a SaaS product. So I'll go to ours, and then just keeping in line with that same project, I'm going to go to um, that, that um, Discovery game, which happened to be a collaboration between us and Zach Toys. So I go to Scuba Adventures. And then this is everything that it does. Um, you can start message threads. So the same way there's like discussion boards and you might want to talk about the design or the hosting or uh, the look and feel or how to set up your, and your um, iTunes store. And you start those as different message threads. And then everybody responds on email the same way you might have a continuous subject. But the nice thing is it maintains all that communication in one place. So if you're like, remember when you sent me that doc, what was the subject, and you have to search your inbox, and you're looking for it in an email, and you can't find it, here it's all in one place with a really robust search. So it aggregates messages. Um, you can assign tasks, and so you can actually, our project managers will assign tasks to our developers. Hey, we need you to do that promo video, and it needs to be done by this date. And so developers can just check them off. And there's more robust tools for doing tasking, and I'll talk about those. Um, but we do use that. There's obviously a calendar, so we can set, um, you know, this, this project's clear now because it's uh, done. But we set big milestones so the developers know what to keep to. There's a write board, so if we have any ideas, then we'll do a brainstorming session and keep it here. Um, and then there's time, so you can actually do time tracking on your project. We use a separate system for that, um, for getting all our developers to track time, which then ties into our accounting system. But you can do that here, too. And then any files. So as we, you know, made that home page for discovery, all the graphics, we manage them all in here. So Basecamp's a phenomenal tool. Um, I definitely recommend you you look into doing that one. All right, Dropbox. If you're sharing big files, you can do Basecamp. But sometimes you want to share a client with a file, and you just need to get a big, you know, 50 megabyte, one gigabyte big file. Um, you know, insert explicative in the middle there, just big file. Dropbox is a really good tool for that. So as a project manager, you want to look into that. When you start doing quality assurance testing, QA, you want to track bugs. Um, Bugzilla is a good tool for doing that. So the client can add their bugs. You can assign them to the developer. And, um, and then the developer finishes them and then marks them as complete. 
if you um, do agile project management, um, something that's a little more sophisticated than Bugzilla is Jira. You can actually track initial user stories, which is kind of the initial requirements, what the users want. You track their stories. Then you can turn those into you know, tickets that people fill out. We, use, we have used Jira on some projects. Um, we're not quite the best at using it, but um, I would rather we step it up to Jira over at Bugzilla. Where I'd like to go, though, is um, pure agile project management for tracking requirements and completion. Pivotal Tracker is a really, really good tool for that. Um, so project managers, you'll probably definitely embrace Basecamp if you have big files due Dropbox. During the development process, you'll want to track requirements in either a Bugzilla, a Jira, or a Pivotal Tracker. And we use all three, depends on the type of the project. That's only how we uh, track that stuff. All right, so then um, another killer tool is Snagit. Um, if you're not familiar with Snagit, uh, you know, I don't know, shame on you. Get familiar with Snagit. You know, like if I, if I see this graphic and... Um, and I want to tell my designer, hey, I don't like this graphic. I do a quick design, a quick screenshot so you can hear I, I hit print and it just pulls up Snagit. And then I grab an arrow and I'm like, you know, I'll point and um, I'll put in maybe a little text box, you know, and I'll say like, turn to red fish. Make red fish. Um, and I'll either do it a couple different ways. Um, So I got to figure out. Let me let me add a background here. All right. Well, I'll do it this way. All right. So I might make a note in here. They actually have um, bubbles. That'd probably be the best thing. So I'll either go and just point on things and then um, draw an information bubble in here, like make red fish. The other thing that I like to do is if you take Word doc, um, you can just put these little screenshots here. So then I might do that and then I might go over to Word and then actually paste it in Word and do a running list of changes that way. Uh, but Stag is just a really great tool, particularly for visual things. Um, so definitely use Snagit. That's not one to consider. That's just like get Snagit uh, would buy me, be my opinion. Um, and just to keep things light and humorous, you can see this picture. That was a, um, an awesome picture for us getting a gym membership as a new corporate benefit. I saw that. I, I laughed my butt off. So hopefully you get a little bit of a kick out of that too. But um, actually it's fun with Snag. You can see a lot of the different things I snag. Like this was a game we just made for a client called Curiosityville. I have another slide for that. Um, yeah, snag it. Looks like it's forty nine bucks. Just get it. I mean, don't think about it. You know, skip one. You know, one dinner out. Um, but do get snag it. All right. So back to tools. Browsers. Of course, a browser is your friend. Um, I don't need to let you know. You'll need to have all browsers though. Any e learning or web based learning, you want to make sure you have Internet Explorer a version of 6, a version of 7, somewhere a version of 8, even though they're all lame. Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. Make sure you have computers with all those browsers on there because you want to test everything you do um, across all those browsers. All right, so that's development. That's the biggest part of project management. All right, then integration. Um, as far as your concern, integration a lot of times will probably be uploading the content into a learning management system. But if it's not, if you have to um, you know, put it up on a website, then you'll probably want to get some sort of FTP client like FileZilla. You can certainly use Dreamweaver. A lot of times a project manager ends up having to get the final assets wherever they need to go. Many times it's just going to be email too, or you're going to give it to somebody else. Um, and then if you are going to put that content on an iPhone, then there's some integration there. Maybe it goes to the store, the Android store, the um, you know, iTunes store. Then lastly, evaluation. Um, we do ongoing support and we just do a lot of email communication over this. But I recommend, particularly in e-learning, um, create either some forms to fill out or create like a poll that somebody can fill out and give you feedback on anything you do. And there's a number of tools now. 
So polls are like Poll Daddy and Survey Monkey. A lot of times I actually like to just create Google Forms and have people type in a form of response. I'll say on a level of one to five, how do you think I did in terms of presenting the information? And they can just type in a three to five. It's not as sophisticated as having little radio buttons and stuff um, without a lot more programming. But the benefit is it goes into a Google spreadsheet where I'm a whiz bang with, um, with Google or Excel, so I can quickly make any report I want out of that data. Um, if you're not good with Excel, then I recommend you use um, like Poll Daddy or Survey Monkey, um, you know, to actually be able to, uh, you know, get the aggregate results and to know what overall everybody said on certain things. But if you're good at Excel, I like just doing it in a form. Um, so Brain Shark, that's a that's a survey tool. Is that right? We actually did have a. Um, We've used it for a presentation on last semester. Um, yeah, we'll see. We, can, uh, we can't drop a bomb and not um, not at least encounter brain shark. That was me, Todd. I did that in your class, Michelle Allen. So BrainShark looks like it's another presentation tool. So what? Uh, what there's a teach? few other presentation tools, and it actually brings up a good point, um, Bill or William, is that um, as a project manager, you probably have to give a lot of presentations. So PowerPoint, certainly, I didn't even cover those, but you're right. Um, really embrace, pick three, right? So pick PowerPoint, BrainShark. Or um, Prezi is an option, too, that a lot of people are starting to look at. Uh, yes, Michelle, you presented um, Brain Shark. Exactly, yeah. Right. Uh, and then we had another presentation on Prezi, too, um, I think in the same semester. So, yeah, that is actually a genre of things I didn't talk about. Um, the actual dog and pony show. You know, so that would probably be like if I went to my PowerPoint here and I talked about the different steps, you know, back in the beginning, uh, probably in the overall bag of tools, you probably want to have some presentation tools. Brain Shark, Prezi, PowerPoint. Um, and that's how you can do the dog and pony show. You know, you can do the smoke and mirrors, prototype click-throughs. You know, definitely a good thing to have in your bag of tricks. Um, that would go in overall. It's not really a step in the, the um, adding process, per se. All right, good. Yes, and Alice did the Prezi, and actually we have those. If you're interested in those, um, you guys certainly from Michelle and Alice, they have links to um, recordings they did last semester. So um, you guys might even have those links. I don't know if you have them, but go ahead and paste them in the chat, and after class you guys can watch those too because um, those were some other good tools. All right, so those are tools, and that's basically what I teach, you know, a tool teaching tools. Um, I teach instructional technology, so different tools, but I talk about it from the developer's perspective, the PM's perspective, you know, middle management perspective. All right, so now what I want to do, because my company is just exploding in mobile, I do want to do a brain dump. Um, so I'm going to kind of shift gears here, but I'm still kind of going to show you that discovery piece. Um, you can download the final game to see how it finally came together. Um, and then we, of course, do the marketing now, so we're doing co-marketing with Discovery on that. Um, and we have a number of other really cool games coming out. I'm actually trying my darndest to become a game, game company. Maybe that was, you know, or at least to grow the game division. I'll never get away from just pure e-learning and from doing um, content management systems, but it is definitely a new focus. All right, so mobile. Think outside the box. And I actually spoke, interesting enough, Greg Williams, I spoke with Greg Walsh last night at a Silver Docs thing, which was um, put on by Discovery. And we spoke about um, gamification in the classroom or adding video games to the classroom. And um, Greg very much spoke on the, uh, you know, the principles behind gaming and how to incorporate games in the classroom. And I just took him in a different direction. I said, Really what we need to do is redefine what the classroom itself is. 
And you guys are actually pretty good about that because as corporate instructors, a lot of times you're embracing e-learning, online learning, online synchronous learning, and not putting people in rows as much anymore. But this happened to be um, the secondary school. So I want to pick up some of that presentation. I know um, Michelle and Alice, I probably showed some of these slides before. Uh, but I want you to think outside of the box, and very much with mobile, that's what it is. We're not really lecturing to people anymore. And the modern day secondary classroom looks like this. And we're not really lecturing to students in rows anymore. Those years are beyond us. Um, and I'm being somewhat you know, facetious and speaking five years ahead of ourselves. But we need to really think outside of the box. And that's what we do with mobile now. Because where we're going is kids used to playing this video game. Um, so that's really the experience that you need to think about. So yeah, there's these tools. But a good project manager, I said you should be the quarterback and not the, um, and not the water carrier because the good project manager should be the one that has a lot of the vision for what needs to get done. And what you guys can do is kind of level set your mindset now in terms of what is that vision. And that vision that we're going is that students of tomorrow are going to be wanting this video game experience and not sitting in rows. Um, now, this will not be for everybody. There's still a lot of stuff of kinesthetic learning that has to be hands-on. that has to be in groups, physically in a lab somewhere. Uh, but certainly, a lot of the lecturing, going to a physical location and seeing somebody lecture, we're going to eliminate the physical presence needed for that. We're doing that in a number of ways. We're doing that with, like tonight, I'm, I'm speaking across um, GoToWebinar. Um, UMBC's program also has a um, they also have a connect account which I use because you can record it which is really nice um, so I like to use that tool as well uh, but it's still largely I'm lecturing to you um, something we're doing that one screenshot I showed before of Curiosityville we're actually making interactive learning games for um, three to seven year olds for this client it's actually really cool because you play these games and it's just gaming but we actually make the games that cross-reference um, common core and state standards and so as you play the game we keep track of what standards you're accomplishing and then parents can log in and they can actually see where students are doing well and where they're not doing well and so they know if the student isn't doing well in the math games that the pair can actually go behind and work with Curiosity Bowl to prescribe new games that will reinforce um, concepts students need learning on. So this is really where things are going. Um, and it is really gaming, but it's, it's some really cool games. We just did a launch for them, too, um, actually this past week. That launched Monday morning. Um, that's, it was a soft launch, curiositybuild.com. Um, you know, I recommend you look at that, too. Um, okay, so the rise of mobile, just to let you know, it's not going anywhere. For education, the iPad was huge. This year in the United States, mobile is going to be the predominant platform that people access the Internet. So there was one question, is mobile learning a fad or not? It's not a fad. It is the big paradigm shift. The same way that, you know, computers aren't just going to go away and we're still always going to have, you know, telephone capabilities. Um, you know, it's, it is here to stay. It is the big paradigm shift. Everything is going to be mobile. Um, and I'll talk about where the future is going next. We're actually, actually behind in this country. In Asian countries, they're already more progressive than we are. They do um, payments through uh, mobile devices, through smartphones and near-field communication. In African countries, they do it through SMS. So the shopkeeper will say, you know, send you an SMS. Is $2 okay? You hit yes. And then it gets billed to their phone plan because they actually don't have credit cards there, but they're faster than we are now. Um, they're circumnavigating a lot of that infrastructure that we have. But mobile is here to stay. The other interesting thing is there's 10 times the number of devices. So, you know, as you do mobile, you know, as you do e-learning, you need to think about all those different browsers. Now you need to think about all the different platforms and really looking at your audience and what devices do they have? So students, for instance, a lot of times they have access to iPod touches, but they might not have iPhones. Um, and chances are if they have money in the household, somebody has an iPad or a um, K-12 
Kindle or a Nook, which is Android. Um, so you can certainly hit those devices. All right, so mobile web, some very quick statistics. Um, there's 5 billion devices. Video is 70% of the traffic. Games are the biggest categories. And um, the most interesting thing, though, is um, classrooms still prohibit mobile devices, most, a majority, like 85% 80, of all classes. And this is a secondary statistic, uh, but they prohibit it. But interesting enough, over 70%, it's 71% of all students actually have smartphones in this classroom, in secondary classrooms. Uh, so middle and high school, 71% has smartphones. And what they're doing is when the teacher is off lecturing at the chalkboard, with their back to the student. The student actually do pocket texting. And then they have these, um, they'll put in like shoes and backpacks, a little LED, so they can pocket text and then see the LED in their backpack so they can get the response. So we're shunning them saying you can't use mobile devices and we're in the dark. They're actually doing it unbeknownst to the teacher. Um, it's really kind of sad. Um, that's good if you're trying to change that in Carroll County. And, and absolutely, um, William, uh, kids with ADHD uh, or ADD, you know, if they're having, you know, if they just have some sugar and they just can't concentrate, yeah, throw them in the gamer chair in the back with, you know, Scoob Adventures and have them take a time out, but they learn for 30 minutes versus, you know, making them sit in the hall or sit on their hands, or I used to have to stand up in the back of the classroom, but I still tuned out the teacher. I just felt like an idiot, so I stood there quiet. Um, but yeah, obviously that's one thing games can do. Um, I really see that you can do gaming and learn so much on your own and independent study and then use the classroom for more group sessions um, or once we start bringing the MMOs, the massively multiplayer online games, which is I think is a hilarious that they even have that acronym MMO, but they need massively multiplayer online education, MMOE. That's the new thing, MMOE, you hear it here first. So it's MMO. Let's start creating MMO in the classroom. And then you maybe get them together online. You don't actually have to have them. Um, um, but it'd be, it'd be such a better learning experience if, if we were all learning together. Um, for instance, somebody, um, actually I think it was um, one of my clients today, I talked about Greg Walsh to a client who um, is another teacher in the program. Um, Greg Walsh talked about an example where um, he used to take people to Second Life and show um, um, Shakespeare's Globe Theater. And it was really cool because everybody created an account and he kind of gave them a tour. And even though he was a teacher, everybody was there kind of mano a mano experiencing together. Where I'm largely lecturing to you right now and I'm ashamed that I'm doing it. I wish I, wish I had this content in a way we could learn it a little better. Like if we could, you know, go through the production cycle and like, you know, be flies together and we could buzz around an office and be flies on the wall and kind of see how people are doing it. I'm like, hey, biz biz guys, look, they're using InDesign to biz biz make wireframes. Uh, you know, that would be a little cooler. Well, actually, one of my clients told me today that um, he had a great example. Somebody said, if you want to learn what a white blood cell does, we should be a video game where we're all white blood cells and we need to fly around the body and we need to find the virus. Um, um, and we need to actually um, attack the virus and and um, surround it and snuff out those cells. I think I'm I'm not much of a biologist, but I think I'm describing the gameplay effectively enough. And then um, you know, and then we get like a little start up, beep beep beep, and we go off and we're like blood white blood cells, and we're playing together, and like there's information stuff on the screen. That'd be a really cool way of learning that. Uh, but yeah, needless to say, we need to figure out how to incorporate some stuff. Somebody asked a great question last night, why don't we do that? And there's a number of reasons. Uh, most learning content is held by the publishers. They've got a monopoly on you know, something that's turnkey, printing more books, and they don't want to lose that monopoly. There's an extreme cost to producing that level of sophistication in e-learning. Um, you know, there's just a number of buried entries. The content changes so readily. Um, so anyway. So um, anyway, some resources. A lot of people ask this question, what's available? Um, I do want to bring an iPad into my classroom. I'm not ready to make a game unto myself. Um, certainly books. I encourage you to burn the books. 
um, or at least don't order a new set of books when you have to. Um, I absolutely, out of principle, don't make my students buy any books. Um, it just kills me. Go buy Snagit. I'd rather you buy Snagit over actually buying a piece of print. Um, iBooks, there's a tremendous amount of books out there. Um, really embrace digital books. They're great. I think you probably know that one. Um, you can actually create books yourself. So I could turn this PowerPoint into a book. Um, you can essentially print it as a PDF, and then you can view PDFs on mobile devices. So right there, that turns it into a book equivalent. Um, if you want a little more versatility out of that, you can't just put a PDF necessarily up in the store. Uh, but there's a number of tools. If you just go to Wikipedia, you can turn a PDF or a Word doc into an EPUB, and then you can actually submit that to the Android store. So um, you know, so embrace that. Just start making eBooks. But me, despite me saying you can turn something into a a, a book, a, you know, like an eBook, try to put graphics in. You can actually drop video into them. Don't make it a page turner. That's boring. Um, we've got so much more capabilities than just having a turning book. You know, that's why it killed me that the Kindle came out. And they're like, just like a book. It's got the same feel. White screen, black text. I'm like, come on, man. Books, you can't embed a video in the middle of it, but on a Kindle, you should be able to drop a video in the middle of it. Um, and so now they're there, right? I mean, they, they try to, you know, kind of keep the nostalgia of a book, and then they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Why don't we actually allow for more than that? Um, and they do now. But for people that still want the books, you can have that book feel. And the nice thing is you can distribute them. You can pay a buck. Um, you don't, you know, store them up on the shelf indefinitely. Uh, but beyond books, there's a number of apps that are really good. For learning space, um, there's some really cool apps that are just a couple bucks. Uh, you know, it's actually cheaper to you know buy an iPad and, and download some apps for students than than books nowadays. A lot of times, for learning math, there's some really cool you know chalkboards that you can do collaboratively even. Um, so look into those. E-publishing platforms. I talked about InDesign. Um, InDesign, which you could use for storyboarding, you can actually make. Uh, magazines using InDesign, you can publish that directly into an app now. Adobe has a platform for that. You can also use Quirk, um, so I suggest those too. Now some trends, kind of those were some more tools and production of how to make mobile, but some more trends. So um, social gaming is really huge. Um, Zynga, there's an office right here in uh, Baltimore. They make Farmville um, and uh, Poker, uh, Poker Kings or whatever the name of their game is. So start thinking about how to embrace social media. It really falls on the informal side of the spectrum. Um, speaking of that, um, I actually have this great slide, and, and my students will see this before, uh, they've seen this before, uh, but I should actually tell you, you know, I'm really speaking this mobile and online learning. Um, it's really on the informal spectrum, and it's worth just covering that, that spectrum, because I think it's something that, um, that is worth reinforcing here. All right, so these are a bunch of different tools, and I've talked about a ton of them today. Um, and I'll zoom in a bit more so you can um, see this a little easier. All right, so there's a, a lot of software here. You can see all the left, mobile, polling, wikis, blogs. Everybody wants to know, how can I make Facebook for learning? You could use Facebook as your learning management system and essentially deliver your content through Facebook. That's really the best way you can do it. But just keep in mind, there's formal learning, which you might create formal page turners now, which is at least a replacement. You know, you might be using Blackboard, some total. Those are the best formal learning tools. But then there's informal learning. So, you know, where you're doing Second Life stuff, where you're using Facebook, um, where you might have been using Wave. This is old now. They actually discontinued Wave. Uh, but that's a lot of the informal. And then there's things that people do on their own, which is asynchronously, or getting together as a class, which is synchronously. So, you know, as I say this, there's just a huge spectrum for this stuff. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, but make sure you consider where things are going socially. Also, demographic-wise, um, a lot of people asked yesterday, they're like, why doesn't this stuff take a big, you know, foothold in education? I gave you some reasons before. Um, you know, that being, it costs a lot to produce these rich games. It, um, you know, the content changes pretty readily. 
the publishers have a monopoly over having print. Well, you know one of the biggest reasons is most teachers are actually in their 40s and older, and they're not adopting a lot of these technologies. And I know the biggest growing demographic is women in their 40s and stuff, but at least social gaming, which is a little more cutting edge than just using the internet or using your VCR, when you look at the demographics, there's a really even split, a pretty even split amongst um, most groups, minus the age of most teachers. So, you know, one of the rig things I had to reinforce was like, it's just a matter of time. Um, you know, a lot of the teachers are a little bit older, and they're not embracing the tar out of this stuff. Um, so, it is just a matter of time. Um, I'd say, you know, we all fall, I'm pretty close to this demographic myself. I actually fall um, in this demographic, honestly. But, um, you know, I'm sympathetic to the fact that, you know, you want to, um, you know, not be surpassed. So really embrace these concepts. Embrace mobile. Get iPads. Download apps. One of my most innovative teachers um, was probably 50, 65 when I had her. And she was the first teacher that embraced TI-80 calculators, TI-81 calculators. And she had us making games on those and doing scatter plots. This was in the early 90s, um, in like 90, 91. Um, so, you know, don't let this stuff engulf you. Really embrace it. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to really tell you, you know, kind of make you guys futurists too. Where is this stuff going? Um, we now are really doing a lot of gaming for like big brands like Discovery and stuff. But Discovery is really starting to get a foothold in schools themselves. And so you might see Discovery replaces, you know, Hugh Mifflin or, um, you know, some of those other big publishers, right? It might be that you have a class that instead of using a Hugh Mifflin book, um, you're actually using Discovery games and video content. Um, so, you know, that's one of the big changes. Um, these are some other games we're making for Discovery, some art games, some science games. So we're making a number of these games. Um, we also have a location-based services um, framework called ViaPlace, but then we release some games called um, Tag, and uh, we actually have another game called Rescue Jump. But they leverage concepts of solo mode, social, location, mobile. Um, and the game was a first caveat, but that's really where just-in-time learning is going. So the classroom is not just-in-time. The classroom is formal. It's synchronous. Um, just in time is very informal. It's a little more asynchronous. Um, you know, things that people can kind of figure out on their own when they need it. And um, that's where mobile is really going. This is actually a just in time learning app that isn't actually for students, it's for teachers. We did this for Howard County School System, where teachers, if they have a student that's either advanced or behind and they want to challenge them or give them some differentiated learning they can actually use this app that'll, based on the student, prescribe different activities that student can do that might be more engaging for that student. Um, so that's a mobile app, that's e-learning that we did for teachers themselves. Um, we also do a lot of learning that's for universities, but interestingly enough, it's not content for the classroom. It's just in time learning of how to get around the classroom. We made UMBC's app. Um, that was one that we did gratis for UMBC um, back in the day. Um, there's so much more we could do there. Um, now, we actually made, this is the generic app. I should have put um, the uh, ISD app in here. We made um, the ISD app a few years later, uh, which is mostly just the website. We're actually making, um, and plus some video you know, from YouTube and stuff, we're actually now going to make a mobile CSS um, version of the ISD pages, too. Um, so that's certainly there. It's not quite as good as the rich e-learning. So people are embracing mobile for more so the mundane right now. You know, mobile enabling your website. Um, marketing is really huge. We're doing a ton of marketing stuff. But pretty soon, e-learning is just going to go the way of mobile, too. Um, certainly iPads. It's doing more iPad than smartphones. But everybody rolls with, um, with mobile in their pocket. So, um, you know, iPads, not as many people have iPads. So learning is going to be more of what you can do in your pocket or from your pocket. And right now it's a lot of, you know, page turners and reading content. But let me show you where it's going to go. Um, at Hopkins, we're giving a lot of direction. We're actually giving tours. And then um, um, UNLV, we're doing one there where you can get discounts and specials based on your location. 
And um, the next generation is really augmented learning. So not are you going to be looking down at your screen, but really the next step is to be looking up in the world and getting learning content based on looking up. And so augmented reality has been here for a little while. You see it on your TV where you see these you know, fake lines across the screen. Um, now they actually have cars where they augment things over to display the dashboard. This is um, an example of video of things to come where you can see you know, where constellations are, get little videos, get prices. Um, this was from one of the Google Glasses videos, um, which is kind of futuristic, but it's right around the corner. And also on your computers, you can get some augmented reality. We're starting to do that ourselves. We're actually making um, some learning experiences using augmented reality. So this is some R&D we did for zoos. You can walk around the zoo and get both tours and then um, zookeepers. We've done some where um, you get different layers of information over your screen. We're starting to do um, walking tours. So there's a lot of R&D. We actually, since class last semester, we netted our first location-based augmented reality e-learning e mobile application. Um, I know that's a lot of buzzwords in there. But that's actually stuff we're doing now. Um, so it's here. People are paying for it. And the first one we're doing is a Baltimore, um, Ohio muse uh, Railroad Museum in Baltimore. So you'll be able to go around the museum and scan QR codes and get video content as it relates to exhibits. We're doing a game now. So in the roundhouse, there's a game where you'll be asked a question. And in augmented reality space, you have to identify the right um, train. And then if you do, Choo Choo Blue, an animated instructor, kind of like Zach and Haley, but a train, will pop up and tell you about the train as you play the game in augmented reality mode. Um, and really, you have to look at um, where things are going. Yeah, that's great, Maureen. Um, you know, walking tours and digital overlays is where it's going. And you can really look at Hollywood, you know, and thank them for that. You know, they had Tom Cruise back when he... He was a little more buff. Um, I watched the most recent Mission Impossible, and you know, I remember watching Tom Cruise like in Minority Report or like Mission Impossible One take off his shirt. And I think most women in the room, uh, you know, you could hear him sigh and their jaws drop. Uh, now I'm sorry, Michelle. In the most recent Mission Impossible, he takes off his shirt. He's got like old man boobs. I'm sorry, like. I, I think most people were like, oh, like, put on your shirt, Tom, um, poor guy. But back in the day, there was a scene in Minority Report where he had actually taken somebody else's eyeballs, and he was wearing them and running through the, the store at Gap. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gap actually does a retinal scan and says, hey, your blue shirt's in. Uh, and that's actually what spawned my, one of my companies, Via Place, which I actually just opened a new office for. Um, so in Catonsville, but there's another scene where he, you know, has this crazy touchscreen device. That was 2002. In 2006, Jeff Hahn demoed that at TED, and actually, I gave a really killer TED talk, a TEDx talk in Baltimore. You should probably Google that and watch that. I talk about a lot of these concepts. But then the next year, in 2007, it was part of the iPhone. Um, artificial intelligence now. Um, IBM and Deep Blue in the 90s beat the best Russian tesh, um, chess player. They did it again with Watson in 2010. That was actually um, artificial intelligence. It was still um, brute force computing, but um, they actually did natural language processing when they read in the question. And then if you add in speech recognition, natural language processing, and brute force computing, what do you get? Uh, voila, you get Siri now. And so e-learning is actually very interesting, just to really impress a point upon you. It's interesting where it's going. It's not going to be sit down and go through this page turner and, hey, voila, you learned content. Um, it's actually going to be these smart agents that learn from you and learn how you learn best and then prescribe just-in-time learning content for you. And it's going to take a radical form. So if I know... You know, maybe there'll be a mentor one day, and I say, hey, I'm your coach. You need to buy bananas and buy eggs for protein. Then my coach can program in what I need to learn, which is 
you know, that I need to take more protein. And then they program my smart agent. The next time I'm at the grocery store, it says, Todd, you need to buy eggs. Well, I learned that I need to buy eggs. I had a mentor, and it's going teacher as the mentor, not the lecturer. And again, I apologize. I'm lecturing tonight. It's terrible. Um, but that teacher is going to be more of a mentor. I'm probably going to program things that then your smart agent will dole out to you at the right time. Um, so that's really where it's going. And Siri, you know, was kind of those things coming together now. Um, the next big paradigm shift is absolutely um, that we're going to be cyborgs. Just flat out, we are going to be cyborgs. Um, I say that kind of, you know, jokingly. It's certainly not going to look like this. Um, I'm not going to replace my eyeball, and not even that could actually be like on top of my eyeball ball. But it really looks like it's stapled into my head. Um, Hollywood, you know, they're right that we're going to do this stuff, but it doesn't go look like this. And that's really <clears throat> heads-up display, Bluetooth headset, and a wireless mic. And it actually looks like this nowadays. So this is an actual product in the market um, where you can watch video. Um, it'll do speech recognition, and you can hear audio. And then they did a, an article where they said, oh, this is the future, Google Glasses, and you can see search on the table. That was a reporter's rendition. It was an awful rendition. Um, it's actually going to be like some of the videos that you see now where you watch the Internet um, on your you know, display, and like you're walking toward the, the metro. One of the best examples is in this Google display. And actually, why don't we finish with, um, we'll watch that video if you haven't seen it. Um, it's worth watching. And there's a lot of joking ones, too, but um, Google Glasses, um, Demo, you should watch some of the parodies, too. They're great. But um, I'm going to show you this, and I'm going to talk about the learning aspects of it. All right, so here it is. I'm waking up. There's these different apps that pop up. Um, there's reminders, right? So that's kind of learning. Ask CGS tonight. It's my personal assistant. Um, I love my human um, personal assistant. I probably shouldn't use the word love, um, although I told her it's going to be bad when I start using the word love to her face. Uh, but she's awesome. She walks in my office and she tells me the play-by-play -play in the morning. But eventually she'll get replaced by a computer that can just reiterate that stuff to me. Um, you know, that maybe I'll have a digital avatar that'll tell me this stuff. But that's learning, right? There's some better examples of learning in this. Right, so there I'm learning the temperature. 10% chance. And keep in mind, I'm wearing a pair of glasses. This is a day experience wearing glasses. But your job in the future is going to be to make this learning content so that I know it um, when I need it. So that's the best one right here. Subway service suspended, right? That's just in time learning, you know, and using um, predictive technologies, a smart agent, augmented reality, all this stuff, right? Oop, subway suspended. But then watch how this learning takes place, and he directs it. Really? So now he wanted walking directions. Whoa, cool. Take a photo of this. 
checked myself. Oh, I'm running late. Music, stop. Hi, what's up? Hey. Hey. You want to say something cool? Yeah, sure. Is that even delay like that? Yep. Okay, here goes. So that's where things are going, and you're going to be designing e-learning content for that in a couple of years. Um, so that's my presentation tonight. Um, I talked about the tools of today, and um, I kind of showed you where things are going tomorrow, and there will probably be some new tools that you'll have to be able to use um, going down the road. Um, but certainly a lot of them will carry through. You'll probably always use Photoshop to design a lot of those things. Basecamp will hopefully keep up with the times. You'll always have a presentation. I would hope that present that PowerPoint would die one day, um, but you know we might not be that lucky. There's still people like me using it to present, um, particularly online. Hey Todd, it's Michelle. I have a question. Yeah. I was just curious. One of my questions was about the use of holograms. Have you guys been thinking about using that in any of your uh, projects? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm, I've got a, uh, a rap video coming up, and Tupac, Biggie, and I are going uh, <laughs> gonna to bust a move. Actually, holograms are just really expensive right now, but, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, look at Hollywood. You know, when, um, when um, Princess, what's her name? What's uh, Luke Skywalker's uh, sister slash girlfriend at one point? Um, Princess Leia. Leia? Yeah, Princess, Princess Leia, Leia is trying to get to Obi-Wan Kenobi, and she records a little message for him, and Obi-Wan Kenobi plays it back as a hologram. Help me, Obi-Wan. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Holograms will be here at some point. Um, but right now, how do you project it? There's nothing that... I mean, the Tupac thing on stage, that's a very expensive setup. Um, until smartphones can, like, cast a hologram, I'm not really putting a lot of time and energy in that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Princess Cinnamon Bun Hair. <laughs> yeah, I misspelled Cinnamon. What other questions do we have for Todd? He's given us a lot to think about. Yeah, most of the time I just kind of make your head hurt, and then you're just like, ah, I can't think. You know, a couple days later when you're like, oh, I would have loved to have known this, just shoot me an email. My email is uh, is there. I certainly have a UMBC account too, but it's not hooked up to my phone, so I get to that maybe monthly. So shoot me an email on my MindGrab account. I at least get to that, you know, every 48 hours. Hi, uh, Todd. This is Candace. I have a question. Um, do some of your clients ever have misconceptions about mobile applications and what they can do and what they can't do? Um. No, not really what they can and can't do. The misconception that most of them have is how much does it cost and how long does it take to actually produce. So the media, you know, they kind of stink. The media blows everything out of proportion. Um, and they, they make guys like myself, like if you look at some of the media and the press we've gotten recently, it's like, I mean, it's all true. In three years, I started my basement. I got 45 employees. You know, we're doing several million in revenue. Uh, but they they... They don't do a good enough job to emphasize how hard it was. And so right now they're like, oh, yeah, overnight, you know, instant success in mobile. I just had to grab a couple of students from UMBC, and, you know, next thing we know, you know, you know we're billionaires. And it's, it's further from the truth than you could imagine. It was really, really difficult. I had a lot of competition. So to answer your question, the misconception is not on the capabilities of mobile. Um, you know, it's more so on that they think they can get it done for a couple brand, like getting a website out the door, and that all of a sudden everybody in the world is going to download the app and be, you know, get exposure to their brand or their product or their e-learning. And so um, the ease and the reach, I'd say, are the places there's misconceptions, but not about like, hey, can it make toes for me too? You mean it can? I just thought it could. Uh, but as far as reach, 
you know, they probably think you can just make an app, an iPhone app, and you're a millionaire and you're going to billion downloads overnight. Uh, but I actually say you need more money in marketing than you do to produce the app in the first place. Hey, Todd, Ali here. Uh, looks to me like um, Captivate Six uh, they just put out is uh, producing stuff that can be uh, viewed on the iPad now. Yeah, great. You could do that before, actually. You had to convert uh, it, right, to the HTML5 code, right? Um, you actually He's did. A converter. You, could, you could take your Captivate and pull it in um, CS5, and then CS5 would output it as native code. Um, so now what they did is they took that functionality and put it directly in Captivate. So now without having to import your file and using Flash to output it, you can directly export from Captivate to um, basically a mobile app. Right. Yeah, it, it basically, I, I believe, um, it might create, um, it might create like EPUBs too, but I believe it actually will export a um, IPA file, which is the equivalent of a mobile app. And so if you tether your phone and you have Captivate, you can publish it on your phone, or if you take that IPA file and you submit it to the App Store, then you can actually publish it as an app from Captivate. Um, and we actually did last semester go through the motions of how to create an app using Captivate, uh, but now that it looks like they made it even easier, which is which is great. Todd, it's Maureen. Um, Hi, Maureen. I'm a, a fifth grade teacher, and there's a new thing called um, 360 um, 360 Education or something, where you can basically um, see a professional development uh, video real quick, like if you wanted to know how to uh, multiply fractions and you forgot, you could like look at a real live video of somebody doing that. But it's real, real expensive, so, um, you know, Carroll County's not purchasing a subscription to it yet. And what makes that hard for a teacher being in the classroom in front of kids is you actually want it you don't want to stop. You, I would see it working better as a mobile app. So you have it on your phone or you have it like on your hip. You don't have to stop in you know, your computer, put a blank screen up, look at something while the kids sit and wait. Um, so right, yeah, absolutely. I mean, getting more real time. We're actually for one of our clients right now where um, we're making what's called an integrated learning environment. <clears throat> And so um, you can actually run your entire classroom through this portal. I hope you can still see my screen here. But you create your lesson plans, and then you can actually align standards to it. Um, so if you know about, like, the Common Core standards and stuff, you can um, select do. Common Core and state standards, um, and then actually tag your content to those standards. Um, but then it also has, like, forums. Um, it has blogs in there and stuff. So a lot of this stuff has absolutely not been available for teachers. You're absolutely right about that um, because it's largely been monopolized by the Hugh Mifflin selling books through the Board of Education. But there is a right. lot of initiatives happening right now. We're, we're absolutely trying to change that with this client, um, you know, Eugenio. And then about, we're gonna... fi about five years ago, I tried to, I was a special educator for for 12 years before I became a general educator right, and became a fifth grade teacher. I tried, I had a whole business plan, I had a little bit of funding and it just didn't go very far, but I, want, I designed a, um, a teacher plan book for an app for your phone that linked to all the state curriculum and IEP goals and objectives and would help track the data and then you could just you know, upload it to the IEP software, and you could write a really good IEP. And um, it, I couldn't get it off the ground because all of these school systems have their own infrastructure and their own programs oh, yeah. that it's, they it's design and they want to use. So how is that going to change for K-12 education? Because uh, people that embrace technology more will eventually replace those that are in the Board of Education. Because I want my plan book, I want my plan book to be like a living document. I want to be be connecting to links and seeing pictures and, and finding things, but also being able to document um, kids' progress 
and be able to communicate that to my grade book or, or so forth. So I had this whole plan, and I, and I was, of course, ahead of my time, <laughs> like usual. Right, yeah, no, I mean, change is slow. I actually, I was a teacher, and um, well, I'm not logged in, but in dev, we have grade books and everything, and you're absolutely right, it does. You take online assessments, it ties in your grade book, you can export it. Cool. Um, so an example, um, we actually had this great tool to synchronize PowerPoint and video and to record lessons, and this was 2003. And um, I demoed it to the school board. I was trying to sell to Howard County School System and did a demo, and it was awesome. And everybody recorded put it online. That was great. And they're like, oh, we're going to do a pilot with this. And then the teacher's like, I, I can't see the content. What's going on? And I'm like, what do you mean you can't see the content? And they're like, yeah, we can't buy this software. It doesn't work for us. I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. The software is good. Let me figure out what the problem is. And these were teachers with um, with Macintosh computers running Internet Explorer as the browser. <laughs> and, you know, first of all, Macs come with Safari. They don't come with IE. And it was worse than that. Like, they had some contract with IE, and then they found out Macs were better, and then the union was only allowed to install Internet Explorer and they actually were forced to uninstall Safari. So our software would have worked on Safari for a Mac. It also worked on IE for PCs and, and anything else on PCs. The one combo wouldn't work on a Safari. I'm like, I'm like, no problem. It's a pilot. I get it. Um, I'll just go to the class and install Safari, put it back on the computer. It's free software. No problem. They're like, you can't do that. I'm like, what do you mean I can't do that? They're like, oh, no, no, the union has to do that. And we don't have the money to get them to show up and I'm like no you don't understand I can literally go in there if you can just log me as the admin I'll install Safari I'm happy to do it and they're like no we cannot do that it is too much money to the union and we would have to pay them anyway just to allow you to go touch those computers and so the problem is not necessarily you know the teachers per se um, it's the entire infrastructure right uh, because teachers do want to embrace it but until you have from the top down, until the board is replaced, you know, by people born after the invent of the internet, um, you know, the the you know the politics, the infrastructure, everything is just going to weigh the whole system down, which is which is a shame. You know, I think at some point, you know, parents will just circumnavigate the school system and do a lot more homeschooling. If homeschooling could just figure out how to replace the need of actually having the parent in the classroom, like if you could have some swim test where the kid can prove at eight years old that they can stay home by themselves. Um, and at 12, they can. You know, as long as a parent right. doesn't work too far away, if you could have some homeschool system where at 12 years old, the kid could plug in and learn more online and then, you know, go to the local rec center for the, um, you know, the social aspects, you know, and the body learning, not just the mental learning. Um, I think schools will just be, you know, stuck with their fingers you know, you know where. Um, I they agree, don't... unless you start getting people like, you know, the, the the Comcast Center decides to sponsor my school and become the Piney Ridge Comcast Center. And, right. you know, we, we are bigger and better than the whatever center. And you get corporate sponsors that are, you know, going right. to... Comcast is a <laughs> tough example, though, only because, like, DSL lines, um, Comcast made a killing selling DSL lines to schools so they could have the distance learning labs. Right. We and have it, but we don't, we've just never gotten off the ground. Of course, they don't use it, though. The distance, right. well, that's the point of the distance learning lab, to have a dedicated DSL line and right. pay an atrocious amount of money. You know, just use iPads and let the schools maintain their own devices and cut the unions out and cut the Comcast out because they're just trying to make a buck off selling dedicated um, ISD lines. You know, Embrace freemium tools. Embrace free software. You know, like, embrace Prezi. You know, they're like, oh, we can't afford to buy all the teachers' PowerPoint. Great, don't. Give them a crash course on how to use Prezi. Do they do that? No. Because somebody didn't sell it to them and it didn't come from the board level. And teachers aren't organized enough. You know, teachers should have separate meetup groups where they, you know, unbeknownst to the, the curriculum developers, are out learning Prezi themselves. But, you know, teaching is so demanding that the last thing you want to do is, you know, try to find the time on the weekends to learn new software. You'd rather just, you know, teach the same way you did before because at least you meet the expectation and, uh, you know, you don't have Not to take me, the extra but, time. But that's why I'm different. 
and that's why my team's different. But I agree, that's the majority um, of the people out there because we are swamped with what we have to do and how much we have to do and and yeah, not enough money there, for doing yeah. it. No re but the, the biggest problem is the resources. When we find free stuff, when you spend all this the whole weekend finding great videos to incorporate in your lesson and and great ways to incorporate technology and everything's working at home and then you get to school and you do a dry run and everything's blocked because of their server and they don't want you using TeacherTube or using this or going here or doing that and yeah, it, it, you get fed up and so the people that aren't persistent like me uh, give up and say oh I tried technology it doesn't matter and then yeah, people I, I jump ship I uh... You know, I, I was really engaging with my students, and I had my first observation, or my second one, um, my second year, and um, they say, okay, objectives, okay, student engagement, okay, covering of the material, um, but then they slam me. They wrote like a diatribe about how, as a young teacher with a long hair and a ponytail, I should be wearing suits every day, or they, they didn't even say suits. They said... A button, a collared shirt, and a tie, and a suit jacket. So then, what I did from there on out is I wore um, a tie, a suit jacket, shorts, and sandals. Uh, you know, because that's the stupidest thing. You know what I mean? Like that is just such the days of lore. You know, back where the teacher had to wear a suit. You know. But we have to accept every single child and all of their differences and embrace the multiculturalism, but then teachers with differences aren't accepted. And I see that all the time. I'm on the multicultural committee at my school and try to try to change those perceptions. But it's it is the people sitting on the board and the people that make these decisions. And I did a whole interview that I'll be submitting to Greg next week. Um, interviewing um, the assistant supervisor of staff development in Carroll County, who is actually retiring, and he, she was like my in to make changes in the county. I'm still friends with the assistant superintendent, uh, Steve Johnson, but um, you know she gave me a lot of information about why it's not going to change, and and we're going to lose teachers, and no one's going to want to go in the profession, and with the race to the top. How are we, how is the education system going to support these 21st century learners that need to be in a global market, that need to be doing the things, because you, are, you said earlier, we're not competing with Japan, and, and we are competing with them, but we're behind Japan and Africa. How is our school system going to be able to get people to be able to do that if we can't use that type of technology in our classroom? Yeah, well, that's why you see things like Khan Academy and, you know, Harvard School and stuff using iTunes and using video and putting things up on YouTube and stuff. It's a grassroots movement that's happening outside of the mainstream classroom. And the mainstream classroom is going to have to get on board and figure out how to incorporate that stuff within the brick and mortar and within a bell schedule um, or, you know, eventually we'll end up, like, you know, trying to spend our taxpayer dollars on other things and, you know, embracing more homeschooling and different things. Um, education, this was actually an ad we ran for, it was either, I think it was the ASTD conference, um, and we ran it in there where, you know, somebody had mentioned that schools were changing, and I said, yeah, I said they're changing um, glacially, like glaciers, you know, like they're not embracing change fast at all. And so this was an ad we ran where a teacher is still at the chalkboard with an overhead projector. Um, you know, meanwhile, students are all in the classroom texting and tweeting and looking at apps and everything. Yeah, well, when I came, went to my new school three years ago, and I said, um, I really don't want this overhead in my room. I will never use it. I don't use an overhead. It was like, what? You're getting rid of your overhead? It was a faux pas. I mean, it was like an uproar. And I'm like, no, really, I don't have the room for it in my, my room. I don't use it. I, the I overhead just, was actually a huge, a huge um, paradigm shift in education. Before, they had to write everything down on the chalkboard, or they had to give everybody handouts. The overhead was the first time a teacher could take a normal piece of print and convert it to a piece of media that they could then write over top of real time. Uh, so... I, 
It is actually agree, a very but when you have a tool. when you have a document camera and you have a projector and you have a laptop in your computer, why do you still need an overhead tip? Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah, no. I mean, it's been surpassed. Uh, right. but it was, yeah, it definitely was a good tool. Yeah, definitely Khan Academy. Look at that. Um, thanks for posting that, uh, Michelle, uh, because they're really taking off and getting a lot of buzz right now. There's a ton of education initiatives cool. that are happening outside of the classroom that are getting a lot of exposure. All right, any other questions? Todd, this is Greg. Hey, Todd, Allie here. It's not a question exactly. Yeah, go for it, Allie. Um, I was just going to say, uh, my company, we, have, uh, we do nursing, right, in the field. We go visit patients out in their homes. And we've bought tablet computers, you know, $4,000 a pop for all the nurses and all the clinicians. And they're looking into trying to do it using iPads instead because they're $500 a pop. And the whole idea of transforming everything that we do so that they would do all their e-learning on the iPad instead of on a computer. And so it's a big change. Uh, they're not, you know, they're doing a pilot testing now of it. But it's very interesting to me. I, I, I'm excited about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the thing about I, iPads, too, is like a lot of people might have a desktop and they never really embraced a laptop because they didn't need to be mobile. But everyone's embracing iPad. So... The nice thing about moving your laning, your training to an iPad or a Kindle and stuff is chances are the recipient's going to already have the device, and so you don't need to also provide the hardware. Versus like Blackberries, companies bought them for all their employees. Now, you know, the employees have the iPhone, and the company just needs to figure out how to incorporate it on their wireless or whatever. Which is why I think students, like one of those statistics, 71% or over 70% of all students have an actual smartphone in the classroom. Great. So I only need to have 10 iPod touches for the students that don't have their own smartphone. And then I'm like, all right, this is going to be the one class where I want you to break out your smartphones. Who doesn't have one? Here's an iPod touch. We're doing all our stuff in the smartphones. You know, if I was a teacher now, I would just, I'd say you must have one. And if you don't, I will provide one. And I personally would go buy 10 iPod touches. Of course, you know, I'd probably be kicked out because the union you know, would uh, I never joined the union as a teacher, but they probably, you know, uh, figure out some way to like, you know, get me out of the system. But um, needless to say, I would just embrace them, and I'd say today we're going to watch these videos on YouTube. Please watch them, you know, and hand out earphones. And then I'd say now I want you to give me your thoughts on it, and they'd fill out a survey monkey form. And then I um, want you to start a discussion board, and they all do discussions. The only problem is. I wouldn't be afforded the time to revamp all my curriculum. Um, you know, I'm still giving books by the publishers that already has handout accompaniments, and it's so much easier to just go hit the, the copy machine than it is to actually rethink my curriculum. Uh, but when somebody comes up with some phenomenal curriculum that the teacher won't have to think about, they can just embrace, um, you know, then I think there'll be a tipping point, and teachers will actually have the opportunity to use that in the class. Yeah, no, they, it blows my mind that they say, no, we won't get you iPods or iPads. It just, it, it blows my mind that we, we talk about being a very entrepreneurial and innovative country, and we are the ones innovating the slowest when it comes to education. Hey, Todd, this is Greg. Hey, Greg. Just, just a thought. I'm not sure how to frame this in the question, but it, it seems to me one of the things where some of this might go is it's not the tool itself, but it's, it's almost like, okay, what do you do with it and how do we use this to our advantage? And like, you know, like five years ago, I, I saw one, maybe even longer than that, where some companies from India were using Skype to create um, tutoring, system, tu tutoring businesses where they're basically marketing to, you know, American parents and basically saying, we can tutor your kid online using Skype. It's a free tool, and we will charge you know X dollars less than probably you know most American uh, tutors. And to me, that was like you know, wow, that's a great idea. It's so simple. Why didn't I think of that? And of course, you know, Skype had been out for you know I'm not sure exactly when it debuted, but 
I guess that that's where I see a lot of this going is that a lot of these tools come out and then there's almost like sometimes secondary and tertiary uses that we didn't think about that could, you know, potentially, you know, revolutionize some things. Just wonder if you had any thoughts. Right. I mean like the whole the whole system, you're absolutely right. The whole system's set up for failure. I mean like secondary school systems, you actually have vacation days and if you don't use them they become sick days. And you build up this treasure trove of sick days that then you either um, can get paid a quarter of them when you're ready to retire, or you can actually go take three months off and be sick. Or I actually, no, no, you can't just take them consecutively. That's a red flag. So the last like year you teach, you um, you actually take off purposely like every a day and a half plus Monday, yeah. <laughs> every week, right? It's this big thing about sick days, right? If yeah. it was truly about the education and you're sick, so granted you have a cold. You don't want to come in, but the sub actually gets jacked on, right? It's just a waste of time. You could teach across Skype the same way I'm teaching tonight. Why don't they roll in a projector and the sub is just the, the technical assistant and you're back home continuing to teach via Skype? The reason you don't want to do that is because, darn it, I still get paid. It's my sick day, and they go into my treasure trove. You know, I'm going to use a sick day, you know, or maybe they could play on that and say, hey, don't be sick. just teach on Skype and you can get, you know, time and a half. I don't know. I tried to do that with my on my return my first three years ago, um, when I was on maternity leave. I was like, I can be involved in this still because it was such a hard case. I was on doing special education. I had seriously emotionally disturbed kids and these kids were going to like huge IP collaborative meetings to see if they needed alternative placements and right. you know, this is costing the county you know five hundred thousand dollars a pop if and I'm like I can be involved in this I can still do the paperwork I just on maternity leave you know I, I can do this yeah we can do meetings I can use Skype you're a radical this. you're a radical they, you oh my gosh I, I I yes but they don't <laughs> I'm lucky I stole my job. They like me because I'm good at it. But I always think of these things. They wouldn't let me do it because, and it has something to do with human resources. And like you said, the payment, the way we're being paid. If you're yeah. on maternity leave, you're actually considered, like, sick. So you can't be working. Even though I'm physically able to and I'm not really sick, it has something to do with how you're getting your benefits and that you couldn't be doing it. Like yeah, no, the infrastructure, it's, it's homeless <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, areas in Africa, you know, we ran all this cable so people could get connected to the Internet. And then when it came to getting rural areas, we're like, oh, we don't know what to do because we can't run a cable up, up to a rural area. Meanwhile, Africa was just fully embracing, like, Motorola's Moto Mesh and putting free public, you know, Wi-Fi all over their cities. And we're like, what do we do? We can't run a cable. You know, so basically it is our infrastructure and our processes that are so old and antiquated with education that, you know, we're getting in our own way. Right. And it's a shame. It really is, you know. I mean, that's one of the reasons I left education to go, you know, do online pursuits. Uh, well, it's taken me a year to get my blog approved. And the most recent email, it's approved. I got all my signatures yesterday. But after yesterday's email was, how was I going to ensure that students without any um, technology, at, access to this technology at home, were still going to be able to, um, you know, blog and participate? And actually, I wasn't anticipating that they were going to blog at home until like phase, phase two or maybe even phase three um, in my plan. And I've been working on this for a year. And there are more kids in my classrooms, whether they are low income or special education. I'm working they don't have access very, to the internet at home, I know. Right, that have, that have better access than what I have in, at school. Right, but why, yeah. You know, and yet the, the school buses them all over the place. We could have them stay at home, keep one parent member in the house. All the money on just pure transportation go, could go toward putting internet in every student's classroom. Yep. Um, it would be such a better allocation of finances than, you know, busing these kids that aren't engaged anyway, and yet they can't be left behind, and so you have to dumb down your education for everyone else. Right. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's a slow glacial thing, but, you know, there is change starting to bubble up. Um, right. It's just the, the last industry to really adopt change, but, you know, it's inevitable. So we just have to 
wait it out, I think. <laughs> I'm going to change it. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, that's why I'm an advocate. You know, I'm telling everybody to get this mindset. This is where we're going and embrace it. You know, because it's going to be, instead of top down, it's going to be bottom up. And at the same time, the teachers are kind of starting this grassroots movement and starting to embrace a lot of these things. Some of those teachers eventually will find their way to the board and, you know, help change the top down mindset too. Um, but, you know, I predict it's going to take, you know, probably another five years at least before we're really embracing mobile technologies, uh, you know, in a majority of classrooms across the country. I would love to be able to send a message to one of my students that I know is smart enough to be doing his homework right now, but he's out, you know, uh, hanging out at the playground or whatever. And if I just got a little message to him and a little link, and, a, and you know, on his phone, he'd go, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that for Mrs. Martin. You know, because I develop relationships with these kids, and they do it for me. They might not do it for their parents, but they do it for me. But it's like frowned upon, not necessarily at my school. We are allowed to go to kids' baseball games and, and do things outside of the school day if we support kids. But in a lot of schools, it's frowned upon to have contact like that. Oh, absolutely. That's a huge liability. Right. But there's got to be. But there's got to be a way to do that safely and appropriately and monitored so that that kid gets that nudge and gets it through their gaming system because you know it's the gamer that's on, you know, will play every single game on their Nintendo or DSS and are great at that and know every code and every cheat and on all this, but they're not motivated when they sit in your classroom until you... Right, but if your teacher played some sort of first person you know, shoot them up, you know, or we're white blood cell game with the students. How cool would that be? Right. You know, teacher, that's almost like teacher as the dungeon master. Not teacher as the mentor. We need to have this teacher as the dungeon master mentality, you know. That's right. a little Dungeons and Dragons reference there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's absolutely true. You know, I'd like to see it. Um, it's just going to be a matter of time, I think, before, um, before that really happens. Any other questions or comments for Todd? Right, I feel like I'm yeah, no, this is great. You know, I love all the discussion, and you know, if we can have more people kind of empowered and really embracing this stuff, then you know, we might be able to get back in front of everybody and not have you know China world dominance for the next hundred years. <laughs> Which is okay by me too. I think we should all go attack the aliens and just get together and you know unite. But. Um, we haven't found where the aliens are yet and if they're really a threat. But, like, we, we go down, so you said aliens, which made me think of the wetlands, and we go down and we actually take out the alien species that aren't native to Maryland. But what I would love to do, what I envision, is each kid having an iPad or their smartphone when we go down there, and we're interacting with nature and doing the hands-on kinesthetic, but we're also recording our information, taking pictures. I've developed a, um, a virtual root lab so that I take my digital camera out there and we like examine roots. So I have these root labs that I, po that I put on display in my room through my you know, PowerPoint or whatever, but they could be doing it. They could be in charge of their learning. If I was just oh, allowed absolutely. to do that stuff absolutely. out but, Yeah, but you know, they, that's you creating curriculum. And um, I mean, that's where some of these standards are trying to come into play. So as long as you're teaching standards, then great, you should be able to do that. But um, a lot of that, you know, it's top down. You know, you, you're, you're being a radical if you create curriculum like that because you certainly didn't get it from the board. No, they let me do it. But because at all, I can relate anything to, uh, to the Common Core or to the curriculum standards. The, so. Yeah. Yeah. They, they let me do it, but they wouldn't let everybody do it. I don't think a first-year teacher would be able to walk in there and do it. Right. You know, I have, I've developed right. myself as this type of cutting edge, out thinking outside of the box, coming from a different perspective. And it's because I played so many different roles and have such a, a diverse background that I can, can do that, and I'm just very well respected that I, I, I do it, and I get good, good test results, so they let me do it. But... And I don't, I'm not like total, I don't think I'd wear my hair in a ponytail <laughs> and, and a suit if I was a guy. I do follow some of the rules. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I don't. I have a second anniversary of Columbine. I had three students show up for class, and I knew they were going to do it. In Howard County, they had gotten rid of vocational training. So, and these guys all want to be mechanics, but they all lived with their mothers, and they didn't even have a father figure. So I, um, I taught them how to do a minor tune-up on my car, and taught them about like the gap and the spark plug and everything. And I met one of them years later. He said that was the best lesson he ever had in his life. But boy, did I get blasted by the uh, administration for doing that. And um, I wish I could have like related to the Common Core standards and said, but I covered these Common Core standards. What, what the problem is, you know? Right. Um, Anyway, yeah, so we could rant and rave for a while, but we'll just make a pact to um, change the world together. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll drop and let you guys continue or, um, you know, or adjourn to whatever, whatever you do at this point, Craig. Are there any other questions or comments for Todd? Okay. Well, hey, Todd. okay. I guess there's a question. One more. Hi, Todd, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it must be a little delay. This is Kim. I was just um, kind of chatting with Greg um, privately, but I had kind of asked him how does um, mobile learning and gaming work in the federal. Um, I know that where I work at the NIH, um, 508 compliant is, is becoming a must. Yeah, so 508 compliant, um, you know, you can do that on Flash. You can make things 508 compliant because there are screen readers for that, um, like JAWS and Windows Eyes. I'd have to look and see if those are available for smartphones. My guess is there is a combination of a screen reader and an Android device that you could make it 508 compliant. Otherwise, you have to do just straight HTML learning. Um, but what I would say with the whole 508 thing is you can have alternatives for mainstream content. So you could make some really rich games, and then you just have to have a page turner equivalent that also makes that content 508 compliant. But again, it's almost like don't leave anybody behind. We don't want to say, all right, well, the federal government can never use mobile games because that 3% of the population who can't access that content will be left behind. You know, sorry, you just need to have an equivalent for them. That's not going to be nearly as rich of an experience, but again, it's it's going to be three percent that can't get that rich, rich experience. Okay, thank you. But you can make it compliant with a workaround. Okay. One last question for Todd. Well. All right. I'm not hearing anything, Todd, so I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for your time and um, your, your expertise. Um, I marvel at um, what you and your company are doing, and uh, I'm glad that um, UMBC has a relationship uh, with you. I'm, I'm glad Rowan introduced us uh, eight years ago, whenever it was. Yeah. I remember. Yeah, it was a long time ago now. It must have been 2004. I think, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. yeah, which is amazing. <laughs> but, you know, one there. of the things I want to underscore for everyone is, like, in a way, we're in a small industry, and it's, it's really important to get out and to talk to people and to meet them because you never know. Somebody you might meet today could somehow influence you getting a new job or a contract at some point in the future. You just don't know it, but, you know, it, it, it can happen. Um, and, you know, I'm really happy that, that Todd's one, one of our faculty members because he adds, you know, so much to um, our, our program. And I'm, I just wonder, it's like, how does he have time to actually teach for us? I'm just amazed. So thank you so much, Todd. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Okay. And um, I will talk to you later. All right. Okay, everyone. If you have Thanks. Yeah, thank you.